What is up my friends? My name is Kim and if you like true crime like I do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I post two times a week and you don't want to miss a thing. I hope everyone is having a fabulous day today. Today we're going to be talking about Jessica Chambers. I don't know if you guys have heard of her, but she was brutally murdered. I mean, not that any murder is this was brutal. We're just going to go with that. She was brutally murdered in 2014 and to this day there has been no justice for Jessica even though she was able to give a name when she was found. <laughs> Jessica Chambers was born on February 2nd, 1995 to her parents, Lisa and Ben Chambers in Clarksdale, a town of only 500 people. So small, almost too small. I would say she didn't have an ideal upbringing as her dad had charges of manufacturing crystal meth and a brother who died in a car accident when she was young. Mom and dad would divorce but they live close together and so Jessica was close to both of them. Despite Jessica's parents' personal lives, they loved their daughter. No matter what mistakes we as parents make does not and should not equal what happens to Jessica. I, that goes without saying, but I, I wanted to mention that only so you could get the whole picture of Jessica. And it's not always rainbows and butterflies, but it's good to know. Despite that, in her younger years, she was thriving. She got good grades. She was a flyer on her school cheerleading team. She was described as a sweet, kind person who loved helping other people. It just sounds like she had a big heart. Later in her high school years though, guys, she started hanging out with the wrong crowd. This crowd was questionable at best. There was one point in time that she made a comment to her dad that her new friends thought that she was a snitch because he worked as a mechanic for the sheriff's department. I'm just like, mm, that kind of gives you an idea of her friends if they're accusing her of being a snitch. But at 8, 10 p.m. on December 6, 2014, 19 years old, Jessica Chambers was found burning next to her car, which was also on fire. The 19-year-old and her car found engulfed in flames less than a mile or so away. It's a horrible story gaining national attention. From New York to the East Coast to West Coast, people I've never even heard a dream call me, you know, and, and like Saturday night, they all going to light a candle for my daughter. I, it's just hard to wrap your mind around that. She managed to get out of her car and walk. She's on fire and she's walking outside of her car. She ends up falling into the roadside ditch. Uh, she suffered burns to most of her body, 96% of her body in fact. A flammable liquid had been poured on her body, down her throat and up her nose. I would imagine this was intentional to destroy any kind of DNA. Early the next morning, she died as a result of her injuries. Her mom held her hand as she took her last breath. What an incredibly horrible way to die. She was way too young, just senseless. Jessica's car keys and cell phone were found along the road near the crime scene. The keys were found by a guy who was walking down the road with his kid. And so he picked him up and gave him to his kid and his kid was playing with them. But later in the evening, he looked at him and he saw the keychain that was on there, one that he thought was linked to Jessica. So he called the cops and let them know what he had found. The police found her cell phone and those keys. The authorities 
examined her cell phone to determine her movements on the day of her murder. They determined that she had spent that morning with a couple of friends. She later went to her mom's house where she took a nap. So it wasn't until later in the afternoon into the evening she left after receiving a text from someone, her mom would say. Her mom didn't know who this text was from. She told her mom that she was going to get something to eat she was gonna clean out her car. She wasn't seen again after she left her mom's house until 5.30 p.m. She went to a gas station. This gas station was about a mile and a half from where her body was later found. A Mid-South teenager burned to death may come soon. Now that police have surveillance footage of Jessica Chambers before her death, take a look at this video that shows Jessica at a Panola County, Mississippi gas station. WMC Action News 5's Michael Clark actually uncovered this video that is now part of this investigation and is live with details tonight. Michael? In the town of Cortland. This was the last time she was seen alive on this camera footage. The police started with the location data from her cell phone. They wanted to track what was she doing. This showed that she had went to or nearby Batesville. Batesville is a town and this was around 6 p.m. But then she returned to Cortland around 6.30 p.m. It is not known what she was doing in Batesville at this point, but about 15 minutes later, after she got back into town, she called her mother. Her mo mother noticed it was unusually quiet in the background. She didn't hear any music. She didn't hear any people. It was just quiet, and that wasn't typical. Usually when she called her, she heard some kind of background noise, but it was really quiet. At 7.30, she drove to the area where her body was found, and that was a half hour later after she talked to her mom. Police are stunned. There wasn't any witnesses, but there was one clue. While she was being treated by first responders, they asked her, who did this to you, Jessica? Who did this to you? And she said what sounded like the name Eric or Derek. The police got to work with this information. Nearly everyone from the area with these names were questioned, but they were all ruled out. They interviewed over 150 people. They also questioned her boyfriend. His name was Travis Sanford, but he was incarcerated at the time of her death. So he couldn't have done it. Uh, he was 33. A side note, this is a side note. He was killed at 7.30 in the morning by a gunshot in front of his house in Cortland. What is going on in this town? I looked it up and the crime rate isn't terrible. It's higher than the normal average, but this is only a population of 672 people. It, it's crazy, but I did find this review, so I wanted to share this review. This is a total side note, but I couldn't believe that he was killed as well. It was just like, wow, what is going on here? But back to it, sorry about that. They interviewed one fella by the name of Derek, right? Because they heard Derek, Eric, something like that. His name was Derek Holmes. He allegedly stalked Jessica in the past. He had an alibi. He was home with his mom. Is, is that really even an alibi? <laughs> But also his cell phone showed that he was at home at the time that of Jessica's murder. And Jessica and Derek never had any communications 30 days prior to the incident or the day of. I guess that really doesn't mean anything, but they saw this as him being ruled out. So then the police got a lead from her cell phone. Quentin Tellis. The two had known each other for a few weeks and allegedly were hooking up. He was also the last person who texted her before her death. He was known to be a gang member. He had prior convictions such as burglary, drug possession, and fleeing from the police. Stellar guy. He had already been arrested in another murder from 2015 from another woman, right? Or he was arrested. I can't remember what happened first, but her name was, 
I'm going to put it on the screen, Mei Chen Hazo. He had her credit cards and he was caught using them right after her death. We'll talk more about her in a bit, but we'll, we'll stick to Jessica right now and then we'll get to her. Crazy, crazy, crazy. In Jessica's case, investigators connected him through cell phone and text records. Quentin changed his story about the day of the murder several times. Initially, he claimed to have only been with her during the morning. He claimed that he had gone to the store in Batesville around the time that she was murdered. It couldn't have been me. I was in Batesville. But surveillance video showed him at the store at 826. Now she was found just before or just after 8 but she had already been there so he could have easily driven there. But anyways 15 minutes after when the fire was discovered. However location data from his cell phone showed that the two were together until 730 p.m. He had traveled to and from Batesville just like Jessica at the same time. Again, walk me. You gave how much money did you give her? Can't remember how it was. They wanted no more than ten dollars. Ten dollars. I said it wasn't no more. Probably ten dollars at the most. Okay. Then you went back and got in the truck with all those dudes, four other dudes. And you all sitting there. Okay. All right. So she departs. She leaves. M and M. Think about it. When did you call her or text her soon after that? I can't remember. Probably, probably did so, so, but I can't remember. I don't mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Did you go to base and get something to eat? No, I didn't. I went to base for late all that night. I think I went and got nothing to eat. This was earlier. You talk about the time you went and got green dot, right? This is earlier. No, I ain't blood time getting out of you. I don't know, didn't we? Oh, let me went to... To, uh... No, nah, we ain't blood time getting out of you. Well, I didn't. Did anybody know? When told of this, he... He changed his story. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, now I remember. Saying that he was with her until 7 p.m. He claimed that a friend of his picked him up that night. You know, I got picked up around seven. Well, this friend, the police questioned him, Quentin's friend, and this friend said, I wasn't with Quentin. I went to a football game. I was in Nashville. This friend's attendance at the game was confirmed. So Quentin, nice try. That didn't work. Let's try again. So police confronted him with this information. Quentin changed his story yet again. He said that Jessica picked him up that night and the two of them went to a Taco Bell. That Taco Bell was in Batesville. He claimed that the two went back to his house, sat in the car, listened to some music, maybe smoked a little. He claimed that she left his driveway at 7 p.m. However, her phone location data and across the street is a gas station that has surveillance that can see his driveway. The surveillance video from the gas station next to his house indicated that she left at 730 and drove to the area of where later was found on fire. Authorities felt that it was extremely unlikely that Jessica encountered someone else in the 30 minutes between leaving Quentin's home and being discovered on fire. So she leaves Quentin's driveway at 7.30. She's caught, or they get her at 8.10. Like, who is she going to come across in between that time to be completely naked? It's just unlikely. A sample of Quentin's DNA was taken, which was found to match the DNA taken from those car keys. It was discovered that her keys were found along that path between the crime scene and Quentin's sister's house. So as if he drove the car there and then started running to his sister's house and threw the keys. Surveillance video shows what they believe to be his sister's car briefly stopped at the house at 750 
before driving towards the crime scene. Surveillance video also helped show that Quentin had changed his clothes three times that day. That's a lot. Within an hour of Jessica's death, Quentin had deleted all the communications from him and her. Like, I'm getting rid of it and I don't know her. He also stopped texting or calling her, even though he had been in con constant contact in the prior days. The deleted messages showed that in the week prior to her death, he repeatedly asked for sex from her. Each time she declined his request. The messages also showed that she had denied him sex four times on the day of her death. I mean, come on, get, get the point. This guy's a maniac. In February of 2016, Quentin Tellis was indicted on a capital murder charge for Jessica's death. Prosecutors believe that while in Quentin's driveway, he tried to have sex with her. However, she resisted. Nope, I'm not having it, thanks for dinner, no. They believe that this made him enraged and he suffocated her until she was unconscious. In order to distance himself from the crime, he then drove her car out of his driveway to where she was found and then ran on foot to his sister's house, grabbed her car, came back to his house, grabbed the gasoline tank, went back to catch her on fire, set her on fire, and then drove to the store where he was saw on camera at 826. The timeline matches up. Quentin's defense claimed that the person whom Jessica identified as Eric or Derek was the real killer. Quentin told police that th that sex offender named Derek Holmes, who we talked about earlier, was stalking Jessica. And residents of the area claimed to have seen them two together. However, he was ruled out by investigators based on his alibi in several interviews. Furthermore, doctors and other experts noted that it would have been very difficult for her to say, anything properly due to the injuries to her mouth and throat. Furthermore, Jessica did not use her phone to talk to anyone named Eric or Derek in the 30 days prior to her death. So Quentin goes to trial, right? They get all the way to the end. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen in a court trial. Check this out. Like this is one for the books. I couldn't believe it. All right, if you bring the jury in, please. Uh, I've been told that the jury's reached a verdict. Is that correct? Uh, did you all select a foreman? Uh, all right, sir. Let's see. Mr. Lampkin, is that correct? That is correct. All right. Uh, I just need to, I don't need to know uh, what your verdict was, but I just need to know that all 12 jurors agree on that verdict. Yes, sir, we did. All right. Would you hand the verdict, please, to the court, to the clerk? Excuse me. We all didn't agree on that. Sir? You said we all agreed on that verdict. We didn't. All 12. The verdict has to be unanimous. So all 12 did not agree on the verdict? Is that what you're telling me, sir? Yeah, I didn't agree he was in. All right. I'd ask you to step back into the jury room, please. Pass the, pass the verdict, please, to the clerk that you have in your hand. In October of 2017, Quentin went on trial for Jessica's murder. Initially, the verdict was read as not guilty. Uh, what? No, eat, go back in the room, come back out with a guilty. However, it was discovered that the jury misunderstood the instructions as many of them had voted guilty. The, the judge sent them back you know, you guys all have to agree. They explained it to him again, and then they came back and they could not get a verdict. They could, so it was a mistrial. Ugh. So they immediately started a new trial. That began on September 24th of 2018. I mean, not that long ago. And they put it in a different county. However, during that trial, a mistrial again was declared. These people just cannot make a decision. Prosecutors are deciding whether to retry Quentin a third time for this murder, but of course he's still facing those charges for the death in Mei Chen Hazo. 
I know I'm saying her name wrong, I'm so sorry. The victim in that case was a 34 year old. She was a Taiwanese exchange student who was tortured and stabbed more than 30 times in her apartment in July of 2015. This was done by somebody allegedly trying to obtain the PIN number to her debit card, naming Quentin as her accused killer. Her decomposing body was found 10 days later. Ah, that's so terrible. Detectives connected Quentin to her death after securing security footage, allegedly showing the two together. One of Mei Chang's neighbors provided police with a license plate number of a man who gave him a creepy feeling. And so it, that license plate was the license plate identified to be Quentin. After gaining possession of the debit card, he brutally murdered her by allegedly stabbing her with both shallow and deep cuts, showing a sort of torture method, and then leaving her body to rot and decompose until being discovered. Her body ended up being discovered by a neighbor who complained about a foul odor coming from her apartment. Court documents state police tracked phone and bank records allegedly showing that Quentin called Mei Chang's bank the day that she died. GPS allegedly revealed Quentin more than likely was inside of her house, her apartment, when she was murdered. He also used the debit card in the following week of her murder. Quentin, 27 years old, pled guilty in Louisiana to using her debit card. He was sentenced to 10 years before he was extradited over to Mississippi to face charges for Jessica's death. So he's in prison and he pled guilty. He's like, yeah, you got me. I used them, but I didn't kill her. As of right now, there is no trial date set up for Jessica nor Mei Chen. It is questionable if they're even going to charge him again in Jessica's trial. I mean, three times. I don't know. I think they may just move on to Mei Chang and see how that goes. When police was questioned about the case, he said that the Mei Chang case was circumstantial um, because there's no physical DNA tied to Quentin in the apartment or on Mei Chang herself. There is a lot of circumstantial evidence, but no actual DNA. So that's going to be a tough one, but he's in prison until 2025. So they have some time before they have to try him again before he gets out. I firmly believe that he was guilty. There is so much evidence in this case that points directly back to him. I don't know how they couldn't decide that in two trials, but you know, I don't know. Also, it cannot be a coincidence that another girl was murdered in the same presence of this man. I think if this man was let out, he would officially become a serial killer because he would do it again. The nature of his crimes are someone with no remorse. They are of someone of violence and a brutal person. I would be concerned for the town if he was to be let free. Well, that's all the information I have on this case. Let me know your guys' thoughts. Do you think Quentin is guilty in Jessica's case? Do you think they should have looked more into this Derek guy, the guy who was a sex offender in the area? I always like to hear your guys' theories. If you guys made it to the end, you guys are rock stars. I love you guys to death. There are more true crime videos in my Captured Killers playlist if you'd like to check that out. Either way, stay safe, my loves. I'll see you in my next one. Bye.